Okay, let's talk about one of the most critical decisions we make in the operating room, implant selection. You know, the hardware we choose has a direct, profound impact on our patient's outcome. So in this explainer, we're going to clarify the principles for two really high-stick scenarios, using dissimilar metals and mixing components from different manufacturers. So let's start with a situation I'm sure many of us have faced. You're in the OR, you're dealing with a periprosthetic fracture around a well-fixed titanium intramedullary nail. The only platings that you have available is stainless steel. What's the right call? This isn't just some theoretical question for an exam. This is a real-world practical decision with very serious consequences. And this kind of thing happens all the time, right? It's a frequent challenge in trauma and revision surgery, which makes having a crystal clear understanding of the principles absolutely essential. To navigate this, it really all boils down to a single, non-negotiable principle for using dissimilar metals in our constructs. All right, if you take away only one thing from this entire discussion, make it this sentence. This is the practice-defining rule. Dissimilar metals may be used in the same bone, but they must never be in direct contact or mechanically linked. Burn that into your memory. So, what's the science behind this hard and fast rule? It's a process called galvanic corrosion. You see, when you have two different metals touching each other in an electrolyte, and our body fluid is a perfect electrolyte, you essentially create a small battery. The less stable metal, the anode, corrodes really fast, while the more stable metal, the cathode, is protected. And this little electrochemical reaction is incredibly destructive to our fixation constructs. Okay, so with that principle in mind, let's actually apply it. Let's define the specific scenarios where using dissimilar metals is perfectly okay. So let's go back to our opening question, the titanium nail and the stainless steel plate. Can you proceed? Yes, you absolutely can, provided that the plate does not touch the nail. Other safe examples? You could place a titanium plate proximally and a steel plate distally on the same long bone, or maybe use a stainless steel circlage wire near a titanium nail as long as it doesn't make contact. The key principle every single time is physical separation. They cannot be touching. Now, in sharp contrasts, let's look at the absolute contraindications. These are the situations that will lead to constructive failure. You must never use stainless steel screws in a titanium plate or the other way around. Never allow dissimilar plates to overlap and never ever link them with wires or cables. And it is so critical to understand this. Even microscopic contact is enough to complete that electrical circuit and kick off that destructive corrosion. And once that corrosion process begins, it sets off this predictable and disastrous clinical cascade. Let's just walk through it. First, the corrosion releases metal ions into the local tissue. This triggers a chronic inflammatory response. That response leads to bone resorption right at the implant interface, causing aseptic loosening and painful metallosis. And eventually, the implant itself can weaken and just break, leading to a total failure of the construct. And of course, the need for a complex high-risk revision surgery for the patient. Now, this principle goes beyond just different metal types. It extends to another critical area, mixing components from different manufacturers, even if they're specified as the same material like 316L stainless steel. So why is this a problem? I mean, you might be thinking, hey, same specification should mean they're the same, right? Well, not quite. The issue is same specification is not identical. Let me unpack this. Each manufacturer uses their own proprietary methods for milling, for finishing, for heat treatment, and these unique processes create subtle but really significant differences in surface properties, microstructure, and ultimately corrosion resistance and mechanical strength. And the risks here aren't just theoretical or metallurgical, they are immediate and mechanical. You can run into incompatible instrumentation right there in the OR, leading to jamming, broken drill bits, or stripped screw heads. You can create microscopic gaps between plates and screws from different systems, which leads to a loose fit, toggling, and then eventual loosening of the entire construct. The bottom line is the integrity of your construct is compromised from the moment you mix components. And finally, we have to talk about the medical legal impact, because understanding these principles is a core component of your professional responsibility. Let's be unequivocally clear on this point. When a construct that's built from mixed components fails, no single manufacturer is going to accept responsibility. Think about it. The device companies design their implants and instruments to function as a complete system. The moment you combine them with another company's products, you are operating outside of their specifications and their liability coverage. So the crucial question is, who does that leave responsible? Who's left holding the bag? Well, it leaves the person who made the decision to mix them. It leaves the surgeon 
Ultimately, the accountability for implant selection and all the consequences of those choices rests with us. Making the right call is fundamental to protecting not only our construct, but our patient and our practice.